Okay. Good evening. Welcome. I am Debbie Gross, CEO of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. Thank you for joining us at our sixth annual Judicial Independence Benefit. While I miss seeing you all in person, the amazing news is that this virtual event has enabled us to raise the greatest amount of funds to date to sustain our operations. And for that, I truly and sincerely thank you. We especially thank our champion sponsors, Deckert, LLP, Amy Janensky and Amy Rogoff, Eileen Kennedy Heim, Lisa Scottolini, and our proponent sponsors, Cozen O'Connor, Dickie McCammy, and Reed Smith. Your generosity and support is extremely appreciated. As I speak, you will see scrolling a list of our many supporters and some wonderful tributes to our awardee, Bob Heim, and our keynote speaker, David McCraw. This has been a very active year for PMC. We have increased by more than triple our educational programming about the judiciary and the courts. Again, virtual programming has been a benefit for PMC. We held more than 60 educational workshops and we were able to pair up with over 35 community organizations and libraries across Pennsylvania to explain our court system and how it impacts Pennsylvanians' lives. We also held programs on landlord-tenant law, criminal law, family law, state law, and protection from abuse. We have gone into schools and provided civics education. We have held CLE, CJE programming for lawyers and judges on the importance of public access to the courts. And we have held our one day law school for journalists to assist them in their coverage of the courts. In all, we have informed and impacted as many as 2,600 community members and partnered with more than 20 judges and 30 ambassadors volunteers to help present our educational workshops. Information on these programs is available on our website, www.pmconline.org. As we all know, the independence of our third branch of government, the judiciary, is crucial to our democracy's survival and success. PMC was created as a result of a crisis in confidence in the judiciary to work to reform Pennsylvania's courts, primarily focusing on changing the method of judicial selection. And while we continue fighting for this change, we have encountered some strong headwinds this year. Particularly, there was a, a proposal for a constitutional amendment to change the way we elect our appellate judges statewide and divide the state into many varying districts, allegedly to make judges more responsible to their constituents. However, as we know, judges are responsible to the rule of law and should not have to be accountable to constituents. As of now, this proposed amendment is quiet but unfortunately we have until next November for the possibility of its revival. In fact, we've just finished a judicial election year. We know judicial election campaigns are expensive and have the potential for abuse. However, the monetary stakes or investments keep rising. This past election, the candidates for one seat on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court raised in excess of $6 million. I learned that a single position for the Court of Common Pleas in Lackawanna County raised in excess of $1 million. Judicial campaign fundraising and their accompanying negative advertisements combined with the public's lack of confidence and knowledge about the judiciary and the candidates have once again resulted in a crisis of confidence in the judicial system and judiciary. Verbal and physical assaults on and threats to the judiciary are upsettingly increasing in frequency. Unfortunately, the judiciary is not the only institution under attack and facing decreasing public trust. So is the press, sometimes considered the fourth branch of government. The media provides a check on our judiciary, legislative and executive branches through its watchdog and independent reporting. As an investigator and disseminator of information, the press provides important information which all too often is threatened to be silenced. Recently, the Department of Justice revealed that in early May 2020, it had secretly obtained phone records and email records of journalists as part of an effort to obtain disclosure of confidential source information. Our keynote speaker, David McCraw, Senior Vice President and Deputy General Counsel at the New York Times, and author of the recent book, Truth in Our Times, 
inside the fight for press freedom in the age of alternative facts, will share his thoughts and experiences as one of America's leading First Amendment lawyers. He has been the lawyer behind virtually every major investigative and political story of the New York Times over the past 19 years. He is a prolific litigator of freedom of information cases, heads up the Times crisis management response when reporters are in peril while on assignment abroad, and an avid advocate for freedom of expression and press rights. In his spare time, he is a lecturer at Harvard School of Law, an adjunct professor of NYU Law School, and actively involved in pro bono work around the world. I don't know how he does it. He, he, he's even multitasking tonight, leaving us for a media law dinner in New York City. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming David McCraw. Thank you so much, Debbie. I truly appreciate that. Um, and I have to salute the good work that all of you are doing. Um, I started my legal career as a clerk for a judge on the New York State Court of Appeals. So I gained a firsthand understanding of how important the state courts are. Yeah, I know the federal courts get all the attention. I also know in people's lives, it's the state courts that matter. And so salute to all of you for, for your good work. Uh, I also say that selfishly since we sometimes end up in the, the Pennsylvania <laughs> state courts. So any help you can get getting better judges, I'm all for it. Um, I was struck um, a few days ago, like on November 1st, when I found buried in a, a list of cases being denied cert by the US Supreme Court, a dissent that was written by Justice Gorsuch and joined by Justice Sotomayor. Now, this should give you pause, right? People have acted very strangely during COVID, but Gorsuch and Sotomayor coming together to dissent. What, 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 what exactly was going on? And it was an interesting case because it was a case in which the ACLU had petitioned to have the FISA court, the secret foreign intelligence court, have its, some records be made public. They'd lost that case in front of FISA. They'd lost that court on, a, they'd lost that case on appeal and the Supreme Court was refusing to hear it. And the lower courts had found that um, there was no right of access no right of access in the FISA court to, to, to records. And DOJ had taken the position that that decision itself was unappealable. Gorsuch said something very interesting in, 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 in ending that decision, which was, this case presents questions about the right of public access to Article III judicial proceedings of grave national importance. Maybe even more fundamentally, this case involves a government challenge to the power of this court to review the works of Article III judges in a subordinate court. If these matters are not worthy of our time, what is? His concluding line. And it took me back to sort of my personal history on this, this question of open access. And I, and I really went back about 40 years uh, to 1979 and 1980. I was a college professor in those days. And it was my privilege to work with a Chinese scholar who had come to America, it's right after the Cultural Revolution, come to America and was trying to understand the press. And she was having some difficulties because she insisted on reading the New York Post and the New York Daily News, the two tabloids. And she had two questions that she brought to me. One is, why is there so much attention in the New York Post to the mats? Well, the mats, the mats, the mats, what are you talking about? And she goes, the mats, the, the mats, the baseball team, the New York mats. And well, I thought that was actually a pretty good description of the Mets, that they were in fact doormats, um, and, but didn't quite understand why so much attention was paid. The other question though she had was about coverage of trials. Like why were trials covered before there was a verdict? Because in China, she said, the lesson was learned when there was a verdict. There was no need to cover a trial until you found out what the punishment was. And it really underscored what's so important about access to understand the process, not just the result. And what's going on in the background in 1979 and 1980 at the Supreme Court is so significant. On July 2nd, 1979, the Supreme Court decided uh, in the uh, Gannett versus D. Pasquale case that there was no public right of access under the Sixth Amendment. If the judge agreed and the defendant agreed and the prosecution agreed that a pretrial proceeding was to be secret, it could be secret. As you can imagine, the press went nuts. Editorial after editorial talking about star chamber proceedings, secret justice, all of that, right? And 
it got it, it, over that summer, over that summer, there were 22 closed trials, 22 closed criminal trials in 12 states. The press was outraged. It got so bad that Justice Berger actually gave an interview to the press, blaming the press for misunderstanding what they had said in Deep Pasquale. That this was not an endorsement of secret courts or secret proceedings. It was a pretrial hearing. It was under the Sixth Amendment. <sighs> Apparently, the pressure was too much because exactly a year later in 1980, at the same day, July 2nd, 1980, exactly a year later in Richmond newspapers, the Supreme Court pivoted. And it found under the First Amendment that there was a public right of access, that there was a presumptive right of public access to criminal trials and completely reset the course of, of openness. Um, in that decision, Justice Berger said, People in an open society do not demand infallibility from their institutions, but it's difficult for them to accept what they are prohibited from observing. Incredible statement, which yes, is hot keyed on my laptop and I put it into every brief I ever do about <laughs> access to courts, but it says it so well. People don't expect government to get it right, but they do need to understand how government got there, whether it's your city council or whether it's a court. And there's no question that the question of access to proceedings has become more complicated, especially over the past 20 years, since 9-11. On September 10th, 2001, I was in a criminal court in New York. Uh, it was a case in which three juveniles, terrible case, three juveniles had been charged with setting a homeless man on fire and their attorneys had moved to close the proceedings. And so I, on September 10th, 2001, had gone down to court to argue for access. And I made my case for why it was so important for the defendants and for the public and for the, the whole process of, of, of the way judicial proceedings unfold for it to be open. And I must have either confused the judge or halted the judge in, in place because the judge said, I can't really decide today. Would you all come back tomorrow and we'll continue the hearing? So we were scheduled to be back in court in lower Manhattan on 9-11. Uh, I can safely assure you that proceeding never happened. <laughs> I was never again in front of that court, but that was typical in the day is the kind of case that I did. Criminal proceedings, open access. And what we've seen since 9-11, of course, is complicated national security issues now before the courts, which raise new challenges. And I learned, as, as Debbie was referring to, just how different the landscape of secrecy in the courts was uh, this year uh, on March 3rd, 2021. Kind of let me set the scene for that. On the night of Wednesday, March 3rd, I just finished teaching by remote my class at Harvard, and I was sitting at home doing what all of us do, living our lives inside our computers. And because I'm a newsroom lawyer for the Times, you can imagine the kind of things that come into my inbox over the course of the night. Uh, there were messages from various journalists at the Times asking for legal help. There was an email from a photo editor with the intriguing subject line, urgent final funeral home question. Okay, someone in the art section was sending me a message labeled Serbian film controversy. And then there was an email from an editor in politics who asked me to review a difficult, difficult story and he did not sugarcoat it. The ray line was not exactly a coveted assignment. And I have to be say this, I was thankful that my, a Nick Kristoff column showed up and it was uh, pretty much advice that gets every lawyer through his or her day, it was called how to reach people who are wrong. But in the midst of these onslaught of incoming emails, there was one I didn't recognize and it actually looked like spam. It, it came from a very, very strange address. It was US law enforcement at google.com. And it had two attachments. Now, I know what information security people say, do not click on attachments from things that look like spam, right? US law enforcement at google.com. Uh, but I couldn't help myself, I clicked. 
And what popped up on my screen was astonishing. There were two orders from a federal court in Washington. One was ordering Google to turn over to federal prosecutors the email logs of four times reporters who were covering the connection between the 2016 Trump campaign and Russian operatives and the Hillary Clinton email scandal. This other order though was different. It permitted Google to tell one person in the world about that secret order. That was me. I was the one person who could be told. It was so strange. Here it was, this secret proceeding had been taking place in Washington. Federal prosecutors had tried to get email logs from Times reporters. Google had apparently resisted. Google provides our email system. And in that showdown between Google and, and the Federalist uh, prosecutors, the court had finally relented and said, I could be told. And it was, I don't know if any of you have been involved in this, but uh, I can't file papers in a secret proceeding. I have to call the, the US Attorney's Office and the US Attorney's Office will petition the court for me. Um, over the course of time, I was able in the end to get uh, permission to uh, inform our outside counsel. And we worked together and we were able to get DOJ to back down and withdraw its demand for the email data, which was a great victory for us. And ultimately three months after that, uh, the gag order was dissolved, so I can tell you and everybody else about what happened. We've been seeking the unsealing of the papers in that case, and we've made great progress. And one of the things that we that you see in that is that a government that when when the government is permitted to file papers outside of the public view, that the arguments are well. Let's just say that it would have been easy to challenge them. They never told the court that the investigation wasn't actually secret. The New York Times had actually written about the investigation that they were keeping secret that the Times had written about a year before, that um, important issues of public policy were being debated without the public seeing it. And as the judge has gone about unsealing, to his credit, unsealing many of these records, it's just a reminder of how differently the proceeding would have unfolded had the public been there, had there been oversight, had it been in an open court system. But so I take the point that, that yes, openness in the courts are more complicated today than they were in 1979 uh, when I was dealing with my Chinese scholar friend and more complicated than those cases that involve uh, the trial of uh, criminal defendants who are they're being prosecuted. And it's no question that privacy is a bigger issue today. And that along with national security makes all these things harder. And I take that balance has to be struck. That openness is one value, an important value, but not the only value. But take it from someone who was once gagged in a secret proceeding, openness in our courts has never been more important and we owe it to ourselves to get it right. To quote Justice Gorsuch, if these matters are not worthy of our time, what is? So thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to talk with you tonight. Thank you, David, so very much. David is not the only revered First Amendment lawyer we have in our presence tonight. Bob Heim, PMC's board chair and one of our co-founders is a nationally known trial lawyer who has focused his practice on First Amendment antitrust securities, products liability and complex commercial litigation. Bob has been a strong advocate of pro bono work and of the public interest law community in Philadelphia. I had the good fortune to first meet Bob on the opposite side of a case and then get to know him better through my involvement with the Philadelphia Bar Foundation and the Philadelphia Bar Association. As a former chancellor, Bob was instrumental in the creation of the public interest law section of the Bar Association and an early supporter of DINE. Uh, DINE, sorry. In 1991, as chancellor, Bob appointed to the Board of Governors two minority members of the bar. He was sued over these actions and taken to court, but prevailed. Bob is not only a remarkable lawyer, but a truly good, caring, and wonderful person. 
I have been honored to work with him as the most recent CEO of PMC, but don't take my word as the last. And please join us in watching some remarkable tributes to Bob and a special thanks to Kate's Media. Bob has been a steadfast leader. He has guided the ship of PMC for over 30 years. Uh, Bob has very strong leadership skills, but at the same time, he's a great listener, and he appreciates the need for inclusiveness and collegiality. He's enormously well-regarded. The one word I'd use to describe Bob Hine, and it's difficult to choose just one word, is elegant. He's discerning, refined, sophisticated, dignified, cultivated, and distinguished in all things. Extraordinary. I thought a lot about this. What would be one word that sums him up? And I went through genuine, unique, surprising, brilliant, and I finally landed on extraordinary. Bob Heim, I would say in one word is unflappable. And I say that because he's argued in front of the Supreme Court uh, many times. He's one of the top arguers in appellate work that we have. And he can be asked myriad of questions. And he never gets flustered. And he always has an answer. And he's always polite, even when he's going negative against justice asking a question. I've met some incredibly smart people, but I don't think I've met anybody wiser than Bob. And wise is not just a question of intellect. It's intellect and judgment and instinctively knowing the right thing to do. Uh, Bob is authentic. He's true to his personality and his values, regardless of pressure or with, with whomever he's interacting with, whether it's a, a large company's general counsel, um, a public interest lawyer, his firm support staff, um, the cashier at his firm's cafeteria. What you see is what you get. Bob was a terrific mentor for me. He always um, gave me opportunities. He challenged me um, in the nicest way possible. But perhaps most importantly, he always treated me with respect and he trusted me. The legal community is replete with individuals with intellectual prowess and drive and not a little ambition. Bob has really soared above this field because he's used his plentiful personal gifts without stridency or malice and always in service of others. He is a gentleman of the first order. And what makes him really different than the rest of us is his calmness and his balance. Um, he doesn't get flustered. He doesn't feel flustered. Um, and he really has his priorities set. His family and his friends will come first. And you don't see that in people who are as brilliant and who is, are as successful as Bob. He's caring. He cares about people in general. He cares about his clients. He cares about Philadelphia. I mean, he's just a, an exceptional guy. He's calm, he's thoughtful, and when he talks, you feel like you're the only person in the world. He is really, singularly, the most persistent person I have ever met. And he continues on a mission when he thinks he's right. And unlike the rest of us, if we did that, people would become exasperated with us. They would become annoyed with us. But for Bob, they think he's genuine. And isn't that cute? A Supreme Pennsylvania Supreme Court justice once told me confidentially that he was one of the two best litigators in Pennsylvania. I mean, I think he's just a great lawyer. 
Because you want your lawyer to be smart, effective, but you want your lawyer to be wise and, and, and have the ability to advise you the best way to go. He is you know, wickedly smart. He can size up uh, a situation with great judgment. He is, I would say, a lawyer's lawyer. Bob is revered by the legal community because of his participation, uh, not only as one of the top lawyers in the city of Philadelphia and the state of Pennsylvania, but the kind of things he does that are pro bono. He's very active in civic pursuits. He always gives of himself. We've been blessed with great leadership over 30 plus years at PMC, but at the top of that list would be Bob Hine. Bob has been PMC's soul from its inception. He has never lost faith in its mission, in the rightness and goodness of that mission, and he's continued to support the work emotionally, financially, and intellectually over decades. Chief Justice Vanderbilt of the New Jersey Supreme Court, who's revered, once spoke about merit selection and said, merit selection is not a sport for the short men. In this race for merit selection, Bob has proven that he's a long distance runner, never gets out of breath. There's simply no quit in Bob. And when someday we are successful in getting merit selection as part of the fabric of Pennsylvania law, Bob's name will be at the top of the list of the reasons we were successful. I would like to welcome Mark Sonnenfeld of Morgan Lewis to give Bob our, our Judge Spaeth Award. Thank you, Mark, so very much. You're welcome, Debbie, and thank you. And David, thank you for your very thoughtful remarks. It's a privilege to introduce and present to Bob Heim the Edmund B. Spaeth Jr. Award at this Judicial Independence Benefit for Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. Having known Bob for nearly 50 years, it's a challenge for me to do this in the limited time that was allotted. Uh, over the years, Bob and I have worked together in many cases in the trenches, sometimes as counsel for co-defendants, sometimes representing amici supporting the position of Bob's clients. In every instance, Bob displayed the excellent judgment that has made him the go-to lawyer for bet the company cases. And Bob usually wins. So why does he want to change the system in which he has been so successful? He will explain that later, I'm sure. Judicial independence was very much on the minds of the framers of our federal constitution. In the Federalist Papers number 78, Hamilton mentions judicial independence repeatedly in his explication of Article 3 of the then proposed constitution. At the outset of the Federalist number 78, Hamilton declares the complete independence of the judiciary is peculiarly essential in a limited constitution. Hamilton further declares that nothing will contribute so much as permanent tenure to that independent spirit in the judges, which must be essential to the faithful performance of so arduous a duty. Hamilton then explains the independence of the judges is equally requisite to guard the constitution and the rights of individuals from the effects of designing men serious oppressions of the minor party in the community. Hamilton concludes that the independence of the judge may be an essential safeguard against the effects of what Hamilton calls ill humors in society. To assure this independence, Article 3 of the Constitution establishes a system of what we would call today merit selection with permanent tenure to avoid, in Hamilton's words, a tendency to throw the administration of justice into hands less able and less well qualified to conduct it with utility and dignity. How prescient were Hamilton's words? The election of judges, especially appellate judges, in partisan political elections is antithetical to Hamilton's admonition. And subjecting judges so chosen to periodic retention elections potentially makes them permanently beholden to partisan forces. I'm sure Bob will have more to say about this in his acceptance. Edmund B. Spaeth Jr. was a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Law School, 
and served in the United States Navy during World War II. He was a widely respected trial and appellate judge for more than two decades, culminating in three years as president judge of the Pennsylvania Superior Court. He also taught professionalism at the University of Pennsylvania School of Law, Bob's alma mater. Judge Spaeth was vocal about what he saw as blatant flaws in the judiciary, particularly the practice of electing judges rather than choosing them based on merit. Practicing what he preached, Judge Spaeth declined to run for a second 10-year term because he viewed judges with a matter of impartial. In 1988, after having left the bench, Judge Spaeth became chair of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. When he died five years ago at age 95, the Philadelphia Inquirer noted that he had commanded attention without raising his voice. In Hamilton's words, Judge Spaeth administered justice and dignity. Like Judge Spaeth, our honoree and friend, uh, Bob Heim, commands respect without raising his voice. Also like Judge Spaeth, Bob served in the United States Navy during wartime, albeit a different war. Bob continued to serve in the Navy Reserve where he attained the rank of captain, thus outranking Judge Spaeth who retired from the Navy as a commander. According to Wikipedia, Philadelphia lawyer is a term to describe an exceptionally competent lawyer. In 1840, de Tocqueville wrote, if I were asked where I place the American aristocracy, I should reply without hesitation that it occupies the judicial branch and the bar. Judge Spaeth and Bob are at the pinnacles of the aristocracy of judges and lawyers contemplated by de Tocqueville and in the tradition of the Philadelphia lawyer. Bob holds a BA and JD from the University of Pennsylvania and an MBA from the College of William and Mary. He has practiced law with Deckert since 1972 and is a nationally recognized trial and appellate lawyer. He is highly rated by his peers. The publication Chambers says he is an outstanding trial lawyer, well respected by the courts. And the publication Best Lawyers describes him a pillar of the Philadelphia litigation community. Bob is a past chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association, past president of the National Conference of Bar Presidents, a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers and of the International Academy of Trial Lawyers. He was named to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's Procedural Rules Committee in 2012 and was appointed by Chief Justice Rehnquist to the Judicial Conference Advisory Committee on Civil Rules. While chancellor in 1991, Bob worked with the Board of Governors to establish the public interest section of the Philadelphia Bar Association. And he has stayed involved with that section as one of the three judges of the Bending of the Arc Award every year since its inception in 1992. Bob has also served many organizations in our community, including serving as chair of the Board of Trustees of the Free Library of Philadelphia, and serving on the board of the Philadelphia Orchestra. While Bob was chancellor in 1991, I chaired the Bench Bar Conference Committee. Bob brought the Bench Bar Conference back to Philadelphia and invited Justice Blackman to be the keynote speaker. This precipitated a call from Justice Blackman asking Bob if Mrs. Blackman was included in the invitation, which reminds me that no introduction of Bob would be complete without acknowledging the steadfast support of his wife, Eileen, who has been by his side in all of these endeavors. This evening, we honor Bob for his tireless efforts as one of the founders of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, a trustee since its inception more than 30 years ago, and the current chair of its board. At this time, I would like to present the 2021 Edmund B. Spaeth Jr. Award of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts to Bob Heim. And Bob, I'd ask you if you could to please hold up the award. And if we were all together, I'd ask us all to stand and give Bob a round of applause.
So Debbie, I think it's my turn to speak, right? But I'm, I'm having trouble doing that because all of this is pretty overwhelming. So, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll do what I can. So um, uh, there were certainly, there certainly were others uh, deserving of honors who brought PMC into existence over 30 years ago. Uh, and another, another group of three stars who made it is what it is today. And what it is today is a statewide focused organization that educates the public about the judiciary and promotes the importance of judicial independence. So I want to acknowledge uh, the other two co-founders of PMC, Ben Picker, who you've seen on the screen tonight, who along with Fred Voigt, who was then the, um, the head of the Committee of 70, but who we lost recently. Uh, they, they, the two, Ben and Fred, were the co-founders along with me. And the three of us recognized that the process of electing all of our judges was an incredibly bad idea. And that bar association politics would never make any headway on that uh, because it, it was just too many different factions. Uh, and they, they, the Bar Association just couldn't get together on the subject of merit selection or on the subject of other issues involving the judiciary. There had to be a nonpartisan group that was willing to be vocal to take on these battles. And so that led to the that really led to the formation of PMC. And I mentioned the three stars. Um, I, I think the first good decision that the three of us made was to find Lynn Marks, who led the organization, led PMC for many, many years, uh, both intelligently and forcefully uh, guiding our efforts in such a straightforward and charming way that Lynn became the very face of PMC to journalists, legislators, and governors, uh, and of course, the public. Uh, and, and when Lynn retired, Maida Malone came along and transformed PMC into a truly statewide organization, taking us beyond our original roots in the East and into Western Pennsylvania and placing even more emphasis as Lynn had started on, uh, on outreach to the public. And then finally, of course, um, when Maida retired, we, we found Debbie Gross and how fortunate we've been to have Debbie leading PMC. Uh, many of you know Debbie, and if you know Debbie, you know that she has boundless energy uh, Debbie's leadership skills, her, her prominence in the legal community, and her persistence uh, in, in dealing with all the, the issues that we put front and center and moving them forward, um, she has started a whole new chapter for PMC. So thanks to, to all of you, Ben, and, and uh, of course, Fred, who's not with us, and and to what I call the three stars for doing everything that you've done to make PMC what it is today. Um, I should also make a, a reference to PMC's programming um, uh, because they're truly remarkable. This past year alone, PMC uh, had its one day law school for journalists and helped over 200 journalists who signed up for it to learn more about the courts and how to better cover the courts. We organized and co-hosted three appellate court candidate forums, which accumulated approximately uh, over 4,000 uh, YouTube uh, viewers. Uh, and you know that, that is remarkable. In addition to all the other people who were on, uh, on Zoom. And there were many workshops throughout the year in which um, citizens learned about issues such as judicial recusal and especially the importance of judicial independence, how important it is to a functioning democracy. 
And, and I'm happy to say that a number of our judges, including uh, judges from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court helped with these programs. But while programming, while programming and citizen outreach is very important to PMC and will continue to be important, I assure you, we have not and we will not give up on our mission to change the way our appellate judges are selected. We have not and we will not because it is honest and because it is right. I, I want to hold up an Inquirer article. Uh, I don't know whether you can, whether I'm doing this well enough that you can see it. But you, if you look at this article, you'll see that it's from 1991, 30 years ago. And the sub headline is, and I'm, I can read it because all of you can't see it, is that Pennsylvania has a wacko way to pick judges. And the article points out that no one knows anything, that people who come to vote know nothing about any of the judges that they're being asked to, to choose. They just don't know who these people are. Now, I, I can understand, I really can understand why some of you may say, come on, isn't 30 years long enough? You've been doing this for 30 years. Isn't it time to give up? But you know, uh, there's no statute of limitations on doing the right thing. There just isn't. And we, we, if you th think about it, we remain one of six or seven states who elect all of their appellate judges in contested elections. We're in a cadre with Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and a few others along the same lines. Um, so, you know, one of seven. It, it's a membership group that, that we cannot and should not be proud of. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what, what is all this? What is it about? What is electing um, judges about uh, when, when you have people go to the polls to, to try to select among candidates of, of whom they, they know nothing? And what it comes down to, and Debbie made reference to this earlier, it's about money. It's about the simple fact that the voters have no idea who they're voting for, and it's about politics, special interests, name recognition, and getting name recognition. How do you get name recognition? Money. Money is what you use to you know, get name, name recognition. In 2015, when there were three openings in our Supreme Court, a total of $15 million, I think actually more than that, were spent on those races. In the election last week, the Philadelphia Inquirer's editorial, um, I don't have it in front of me here at the moment. Oh, maybe I do, let me see, I'll hold it up. Court race awash in cash, court race awash in cash. Um, and in that, where we had one opening on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Six million dollars, more than six million dollars, were spent on that one, on that one opening. Um, you know, I, I, I frankly don't understand how any right-thinking person can argue that holding election for judges is the right way to select appellate judges. I simply cannot understand it. Well, enough sermonizing by me. I, I, I expect and I hope that I'm speaking to the choir. <laughs> if, if all the choir members, if all of us choir members raise our voices, uh, join our hands, join forces, I, I really believe we can get this done. I, I, you have a right to be skeptical, but I actually think that this is the right time. I, I, I have heard from from a number of these groups that they're pretty tired of spending millions of dollars on these elections. And, uh, and if that's the case, you know, maybe it's time for everybody to finally come to the table and see if we can, we can get this done. Um, so just two more thanks uh, um, 
first uh, to, to my law firm, Decker, whose unfailing support for everything I ever wanted to do has made it easy for me. Uh, and and that, you know, that has meant a lot to me over the years. And maybe the most important thanks of all, uh, thanks to my wife, Eileen, who over many loving years has encouraged me in all of my pursuits, has been my idea person. I don't think I ever made a closing argument to a jury or an appellate argument without trying it out on her first. She always made it better, just as she's made every day a better day for me simply because she's there. And I know that I have just embarrassed her and that I will hear about this later, but, but I guess, you know, I, I can take it. So I, I am, I'm grateful to her and I'm also so grateful to all of you, my friends and supporters and supporters of Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. So with that, Debbie, I think we can all say good night. In my household, this is what is known as wine time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Bob. You're so deserving. And this has been a really special night. And thank you all for attending, for your financial support and for your moral support. And now we will hopefully keep going forward with, with, with this merit selection and reach out to our legislators and see you all tomorrow. <laughs> Bye. Good night and thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.